you're appreciative. Thank you, Tara. Um, and he's, we're appreciative that he's able to join us and take some time out of his evening tonight. So if there's, if you have questions for the night, go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll take care of them at the end, um, just so we don't have to stop and go quite a bit and people don't have to continually mute and unmute. And then uh, I think from there, we'll just leave, turn it over to Mitch. And again, thank you, Mitch, for coming and, and speaking with us tonight. Yeah, thanks, Elena. Um, again, yeah, hi, Mitch. Nice to meet you all. Um, I know a few faces and names I've seen around before. So um, Elena asked me to do this, and I kind of scrambled to put it all together. So um, if you know anything seems irrelevant or uh, you know strange, just feel free to ignore that. I kind of focus more on wetland types um, up here that we experience in the state of Minnesota um, and kind of discussing a little bit about how the regulatory process works so you guys have a little more insight into how I make uh, my decisions on projects and, and kind of maybe spark some interest in projects you might have or if you have questions, like Alana said, just hold them to the end. Um, or you know, if it if it's fairly intimate too, I'm not I'm not opposed to speaking up and having some questions along the way if something needs clarification. So um, yeah, with that, I'll kind of start the presentation here. So if I can figure it out. All right. Is everybody seeing that? Yeah, it looks good, Mitch. Okay. All right, so wetland conservation in Northeast Minnesota. So just a little introduction to me. Um, so I've lived on the North Shore uh, since 2002. I'm originally from Wilmer, Minnesota, uh, down in the central part of the state. So um, kind of from prairie country, but uh, moved to the North Shore in 2002 after graduating high school. Uh, got a bachelor in science and biology from the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Um, oops. And then um, did a short internship with the Minnesota DNR in 2006. Uh, shortly afterwards in 2007, I, I did get a job with uh, Grand Portage temporarily, came back permanently in 2008, um, bump, bumped around a couple of places and then ended up with Cook County. Um, 2017 in January will be six years for me here. So uh, combined 14 years of experience in wetlands uh, in Cook County. Um, as you can see, I've got a kid that I've been introducing to the North Shore as well. Um, and yeah, I used to travel back before the pandemic, I'm trying to get back into that. Um, so my mission today is just to inform landowners about the benefits of wetlands as well as the laws that govern them in the state. Um, through the lens of someone who's been up here for 14 years working in them and kind of some of the laws that, you know, the, the finer details of the laws that regulate them. Um, this is an, interest, an interesting picture from an article about how wolves uh, actually regulate wetlands through predation uh, up here, kind of their predation on beavers kind of was an interesting article, so anyway. Um, so by the end, I hope you're able to better answer some of these questions is, you know, what makes a wetland? Why are they important? Uh, what are the relevant wetland types in Minnesota? Uh, how does the Wetland Conservation Act regulate, regulate, excuse me, regulator make decisions on projects? And, you know, how can you develop your property responsibly? Um, so just to kind of a quick little quote, you know, it, Wetlands are one of the most threatened ecosystems, um, you know, mostly because people don't see their value. So hopefully today you'll be able to see a little bit more of the value of some of the wetlands you may own on your property. So just a quick run through of what kind of the benefits that wetlands do provide. Um, the vegetation does reduce, you know, erosion from wave action along lakes and stream banks. Um, they slow and retain runoff from stormwater, <clears throat> you know, and reduce the frequency of flooding, um, you know, in areas that may be a little more developed. Um, groundwater, 
recharge and discharge. You know, some groundwater uh, goes back into the aquifer after settling in some of our wetland basins. Um, additionally, those discharge areas do help to maintain flows of some of our streams and rivers that are fed through that groundwater. Um, wetlands, you know, also protect water quality of downstream lakes, streams and rivers by removing pollutants, you know, kind of filtering those out as they uh, settle or are taken up by wetland vegetation. Um, home to fish and wildlife, 43% of threatened or endangered species in the U.S. live or depend on wetlands. Recreation and education, I spend a lot of time enjoying wetlands all over the state. Um, they're just a great, you know, sink for habitat uh, for wildlife. Uh, economic value, um, commodities, you know, wild rice, um, cranberries, bait fish, um, some are mined for peat. Some can be restored or preserved as wetland bank sites. If you happen to own a lot of property, um, you know, a, a wetland bank site is a really great opportunity uh, to preserve wetlands in perpetuity and, and allow others to develop their property responsibly. Um, <clears throat> carbon sequestration is something that's kind of been thrown out around a lot more lately that may even end up being more of an economic possibility for the state, um, you know, as climate change becomes a reality, um, you know, we're considering offsetting projects with uh, carbon preservation of sequestered carbon, I should say. So just a quick little graphic kind of showing, um, you know, how wetlands work, uh, you know, groundwater flow into the wetlands as well as surface water flow. Um, you can kind of see laser pointer here, you know, surface water flow, groundwater flow going into the wetland, um, contaminants and uh, sediment are filtered out, uh, great habitat, clean water outflow, as well as the slow discharge of groundwater into our streams, keep them flowing during drought periods. Uh, additionally, you know, just great habitat for things up on the North Shore like moose, lynx, um, even some of our smaller players in the ecosystem like caddisflies. Um, there's over a dozen types of threatened and endangered species of caddisflies in the state of Minnesota. So what makes a wetland? Um, you know, there's a lot of obvious names we all know, um, you know, slough, bog, swamp, fen, marsh. A lot of people use them interchangeably. Um, but they are quite different types of ecosystems. Um, you know, most people kind of get that image of their head of a, a peaceful pond with cattails and lily pads, uh, harboring waterfowl, frogs, aquatic vegetation. Um, but there's others, you know, there are forested wetlands, uh, floodplains, wet meadows, seasonally flooded basins. You know, there's also those kind of nasty alder and willow thickets that are real difficult to walk through. Um, so what's, what's accurate for some isn't accurate for all. Um, you know, some wetlands in the state are even farmed. Hayed, uh, you might even see them maintained as a mowed lawn. Um, so we need kind of a more scientific approach with defined parameters to really describe what wetlands are. Um, and they all share these characteristics, these three characteristics, uh, soils, Soils that have developed in wet conditions are called hydric soils. Um, they're wet, you know, hydrology basically means, you know, water moving through the landscape. They're wet either um, above the ground or within 12 inches of the ground surface, all are part of the growing season. You know, a lot of times I'll hear kind of anecdotal testimony from a landowner, well, that area has never held water before, but it might, you know, be hydric with have hydric soils and might be saturated within the top 12 inches and it's probably, you know, it might support things like uh, hydrophytic vegetation. Um, hydrophytic means water loving. Um, and they, you know, support vegetation that is adapted to these wet soil conditions. So just breaking up those different parameters into soils. Um, 
they have several day courses on soils in the state of Minnesota. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon them. Um, you know, someone with a trained eye can see indicators of consistent saturation. They actually cause chemical reactions within, within the soil. Um, here on this one, you can actually see these, uh, this modeled soil is called, it's got these iron concentrations and iron depletions, which will show up. Um, typically doesn't happen quite so neatly in, in North Shore, on the North Shore. We, we don't have really deep soil profiles, um, you know, just because of glaciation and things like that. Um, and as well as we also have very red soils, really red parent materials. So you kind of got to look for different things, um, but just an example of what you might experience other places in the state. Um, you do see iron concentrations in the soils up here as well. Um, other areas of the state too, or even in kind of more established wetland areas, you're going to see these glade soil profiles. Um, glaying essentially me means graying or a changing of color where all of the concentrations of other minerals have already been leached out and you're going to have a really dark organic layer on the top with, you know, some hydrophytic vegetation as well. Um, other things we can look for like muck or peat that you typically be established. It's kind of a greasier feeling type of soil that you'll probably, you've probably all stepped in at some point in, in your lives. Uh, so the second parameter is hydrology. Again, that's how water moves through our landscape. Uh, you know, a wetland is going to have saturated soils within the top 12 inches or even possibly standing water. Um, when I'm out in the field, I'm looking for two types of indicators. There's primary indicators. You know, there's the obvious ones. We've got surface water. You know, right here in the pond, you can see that there's surface water. Um, but there may be hydrology outside of that surface of the pond. You're going to see, you know, uh, saturated soils within the top 12 inches, as well as most likely you're going to see um, vegetation that's hydrophytic. Uh, other things you might experience as primary indicators, high water table. Again, water within that top 12 inches, saturated soils, watermarks, you might see something on a tree that shows that there's been water like uh, moss trim lines or something like that, uh, as well as sediment or drift deposits. So if I see like you're walking through a floodplain and you see that there's grass and uh, driftwood deposited up, you know, above the banks or tangled up in some of the, the shrubs, uh, that's, that's a pretty good indicator that that area is flooded for a portion of time. Uh, aerial imagery has become a tool that we utilize a lot just for looking at, you know, the landscape and seeing from year to year, what does this look like? What does that, you know, field look like? Or can I see flooding or evidence of it? Uh, secondary indicators. For this, we've got to have at least two to kind of make a conclusive um, determination on wetlands. You know, some may include like crayfish burrows stressed out plants, you know, you're going to see that in kind of egg fields where the corn has been drowned out or the soybeans. Uh, geomorphic position is just a fancy name for where on the landscape are you? Is there a, are you standing in a basin or are you in a ravine? Uh, things like that are going to kind of show me that likely this is where water is going to go when it rains or when snow melts. Uh, surface cracks in the soil, you know, so you kind of see that pattern of um, cracked up soil where there used to be water but now it's dried up. Uh, drainage patterns, you know, you're going to see rills going across the top of the soil, etc. There's there's many, many more, but these are kind of the more obvious ones. And then just kind of as a side note, anecdotal evidence really doesn't mean much to me. I have a lot of conversations again with landowners about how there's never been standing water here. Um, this year, there was a lot of areas where people experienced standing water in those areas where there never was standing water, especially along, you know, some of our more popular lakes up here. Uh, finally, vegetation. Um, plants that occur in wetland environments are known as hydrophytes. I think I've already described that. Um, and plants are classified according to their probability of occurrence. You know, so we have these five indicator statuses, um, obligate, you know, 
almost always uh, or occur almost always under natural conditions in wetlands. Um, almost always is a hydrophyte, rarely in uplands. Uh, the pitcher plant is a really good example of an obligate. They need to be in pretty specific conditions, usually find them in, you know, bogs, floating bogs, things like that. Facultative wetland uh, usually occur in wetlands, but occasionally found in non-wetlands. A good example of this might be like alder. Alder I will see most often in wet areas. However, it, it likes to grow in areas where there's disturbance, you know, so anywhere there's been a lot of, you know, excavation or things like that, um, you know, alteration of the landscape through whatever activities is going to pop up older. Uh, cedar is another good one. You know, cedar likes to grow in wetter areas, but not necessarily. Uh, there's a lot of upland cedar here on the North Shore. Uh, facultative, maybe in both places, like types, certain types of grasses, like blue joint, things like that. Um, and then you just get kind of more in your more facultative upland, like your birches, popples, things like that. And then there's most strictly upland ones. Um, things like large leaf aster or uh, hazel is another good one that I utilize a lot. So I've been talking for a while. I don't know how long quite yet, but uh, if you guys need to take a break or if you have any questions, um, feel free to shout them out so far. I've kind of just covered, you know, that what makes a wetland and the parameters we look at when we're talking about it, so. Would you go to, uh, just back one slide? Sure. <clears throat> so if I can get my thing to cooperate here. Okay, I just wanted to catch that last one, Upland. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else, any other questions? Did you say you were providing refreshments? <laughs> I can't, I, well, maybe Amazon will deliver it to you through a drone here, we'll see. So wetland, getting into wetland types. Um, so for most purposes, the Board of Water and Soil Resources with the state of Minnesota requires wetlands be typified using this circular 39 classification system. Uh, under this system, which was devised primarily for the sake of classifying waterfall habitat, there are 20 types of wetlands. Minnesota has eight of these types, and we do break them down somewhat into subtypes based on um, Agers and Reed classification, which is specifically for the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> main differences between them are depth or water depth and duration of water, uh, excuse me, depth and duration of water and variety of vegetation. So uh, kind of one thing you'll learn through this is not all wetlands are created equal in the eyes of the state of Minnesota. Uh, we place higher values on rare plant communities. Also some threatened and endangered species are granted more protections under the Wetland Conservation Act. So the first type, uh, type one is seasonally flooded wetlands. Um, subtype A is your fresh wet meadows. So you can see here we've got uh, you know a, a little slow meandering stream with a wet meadow likely that's going to be inundated in the spring seasons. You know another name for these is vernal pools typically, um, or you know other. There's others, but you know another good name for them is the vernal pool. Um, again, soil is covered with water or waterlogged during variable seasonal periods. Again, usually in the spring, uh, the soils are usually well drained to other parts of the growing season. Um, you know, again, found in wetland or upland depressions or bottomlands. Um, yeah. So another one. You might see is so there's your flooded your floodplain forest. Typically, you're going to identify these through the the tree types. You're going to see a lot of silver maples, cottonwoods, uh, American elm. They're really tolerant to that you know seasonal flooding that you'll experience. See this a lot, kind of in the floodplains of Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. 
Um, yeah, and then we've got seasonally flooded basin. So kind of you'll see these in farm fields even, you know, like upland all around just happens to be a little basin in the corner of the farm field that fills up with heavy rains or in the spring. Very important habitat for frogs and other species. So type two, um, wet meadows, wet prairies, and calcareous fens. Um, you also saw fresh wet meadow as a type one. It's, I know it's a repeat, but there is some differences typically in the soil type, hydrology, and the plant species. Um, and then subtype two is going to be your sedge meadow. There's one here up at the top. It's just kind of dominated more by different sedge varieties. Um, yeah, so again, soil hydrology is going to have uh, organic mineral soil, uh, saturated or nearly saturated during most of the spring and summer, usually with outstanding water. So again, you're probably going to have subsurface groundwater within the top 12 inches. Uh, you're probably not going to be walking through water over your boots as you're going through those most of the season. Um, yeah. So again, may fill shallow basins, sloughs or farmland sags, uh, may bar, you know, may border other types of wetlands as well. Calcareous fens, I'm probably just going to briefly touch upon them. I mean, they're basically the main idea is we don't have a lot of them in the state. Um, they're pre pretty much groundwater driven, upwelling groundwater driven areas where there's an accumulation of usually peat. Um, we don't see them a lot in Northeast. They're actually, here's a map, you can see they're pretty much sprinkled everywhere but the Northeast. Um, you know, typically have to have more of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of a chalkier soil types. Type three, you've got shallow marshes. Um, you know, vegetation is going to be your cattails, bulrushes, um, arrowhead, smartweed. Uh, usually going to be water within the top or saturated with water over six inches at, at the surface. Um, shallow lake basins or sloughs. It's going to, again, you might have them border other wetland types like deeper marshes. Um, type three are deemed a very high value to the state. Um, it's just a really good habitat and we have lost a lot of them in other portions of the state by either draining for agriculture or whatever other purposes. Type four, your deep marshes. So pretty much the same, but you're going to get a little bit deeper water, um, you know, six to three feet of water, a lot of similar types with a, maybe a little bit more of your duckweeds, water lilies, things like that. Um, again, very high value to the state. Um, you know, very little uh, allowance for impacts to these type of types of wetlands. Type five, open water. Again, similar, but you're just going to get more deep areas from six to ten feet. Um, you know, fringe of emergent and floating vegetation. Uh, you're going to get more of the aquatic type species out in the middle as well with your pond weeds, your coontails, milfoil in, in the water body itself. Um, you know, again, shallow lake basins, another very high value resource to the state that they want to protect highly. Your type sixes are things that you experience probably mostly in Cook and Lake counties. Um, you know, a lot of shrub car, willow and alder thickets, also known as a shrub swamp. Um, you know, again, organic or mineral soil, water table is usually near or at the surface. Um, you know, and you're going to probably see a lot of flooding in these areas in the spring months. Um, yeah, you're going to see them along sluggish streams. So you can see there's a stream going through here with uh, alder on both sides. And here we got a pretty, you know, established willow thicket, willow slough. Well, Mitch, what is uh, the, the what is the name shrub car from come from for subtype A? 
that is from the Agers and Reed. Um, they kind of slightly broke up some of these types into A and B. And just to kind of to differentiate a little bit between what we're looking at, um, shrub car, I don't exactly know where it came from. It's basically just kind of, that's where Agers and Reed, they're the ones who came up with that. They coined that phrase, I believe, or stole it from someone else. <laughs> I'm not quite Thanks. sure. Yep. Uh, type seven wooded swamps. So again, we've got both hardwood and conifer swamps here. A lot of what you'll see in Cook and Lake counties are going to be hardwood swamps, which are dominated by black ash. Usually, um, we don't, at least in Cook County, I can't think of other types that are going to be characteristic of, of that or other types of trees that are going to be characteristic of that, I should say. Um, yeah, again, might might have water for short periods in the spring. Um, you know, you can see here that, uh, you know, you, you're probably going to have some things like white cedar or tamarack occurring, especially in the conifer swamps. Um, tamarack and white cedar are rare plant communities in the state of Minnesota and, and kind of given higher amounts of protection again. So those areas that are dominated with those two types of species are going to be, um, you know, put on a different uh, level for preservation. Would yellow birch be in that habitat or just a little drier? Yeah, I mean, you might see, yep, you know, river birch, yellow birch might pop up a little bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure on the where those species sit on the the chart that we you made me look at before. Um, I, I'm not a botanist, but I know enough to get in trouble. So type eight are bogs. Again, another high value resource to the state, very rare plant community. They do support tamarack quite often, uh, as well as a lot of rare species in these floating open bog areas. Again, this is kind of where you're going to see these pitcher plants, uh, dragon mouth orchids, things like that up here, which are really a treat to see in the month of June around here. Uh, you know, really going to have established peatlands, um, you know, really anoxic conditions in the in the water, which, you know, preserves those that organic matter for a long period of time. Um, you're going to see things like sphagnum moss, sedges, leather leaf, Labrador tea, stunted black spruce, you can see here along the edge of the, the basin, as well as here in the upper kind of more coniferous bog area. Um, you know, shallow lake, glacial lake basins and depressions, um, you know, areas where there's sluggish streams, there looks like here along this one, we've got a bit of a sluggish sl stream that goes along the edge of it. Again, if there's tamarack in it, there's a rare natural plant community and that creates a high, both of those factors, both bogs and the rare natural plant communities that occur in them, make it a very high value resource to the state. Surprise wetland type for you. There's incidental wetlands as well. Um, these are essentially man-made wetlands. <clears throat> um, you can see here we've probably got a little bit of a wet ditch that's going to support things like sedges or wool grass, things like that that might pop up in them. Uh, but it's still the LGU's decision to make whether or not it is an incidental wetland. So, could you explain WCA and LGU? Uh, yeah, sorry. So the WCA is an abbreviation for the Wetland Conservation Act. Oh, sure. uh, an LGU is someone who functions with each within a county or a township, or even maybe a watershed district. They're the local government unit. They're the person who is responsible for overseeing the Wetland Conservation Act in that particular area. Um, in Cook County, I'm the guy. I have all of Cook County underneath my uh, mantle. Um, so uh, there are others that work with me, thankfully, but I'm the LGU for Cook County. So oftentimes, as I was saying before, you'll see more than one wetland type in a landscape. Um, you know, you may see a hybrid of two or more types. Uh, type six and seven is really common. I'll see alder brush and, uh, you know, hardwoods like black ash popping up next to each other. Um, this is a, a map from a bank site on the Poplar River, actually. 
you can, it's kind of hard to see here. It didn't show up too well, but you can see it's got five different wetland types. They're all mapped out here. Um, some of them are right next to each other. You know, you've got type two right next to a type eight bog, things like that. So again, not all wetlands were created equal. You know, we've got the ones at the top here, which are all higher value to the state. Um, so type three, four, five, and eight are all allowed very small amounts of impacts when we're dealing with projects in them. Um, whereas type one, two, six, and seven, I can feasibly permit up to 10,000 square feet of impacts in the greater than 80% area, which is kind of the northeastern part of Minnesota. Greater than 80% of our wetlands have been retained uh, since after statehood. Other areas of the state like the Southwest, they're gonna have less than 50% of their wetlands have been preserved um, since statehood. And then there's a little band in the middle, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. And an example of impacts would be? Uh, impacts are going to mean anything that goes into the wetland. So um, like if I'm building a road, the aggregate for the road that's going down is gonna be an impact to that wetland. Additionally, um, it also means drainage of a wetland. So essentially fill or drainage of a wetland is gonna be an impact underneath, uh, you know, by definition to the state of Minnesota. So we'll talk a little bit more about it. We'll get into it. So again, your top tier wetlands for diversity are your type three, four, five, and eight. Um, whereas these ones down at the bottom, you're probably gonna have, or they, they are subject, subject to tank, to change as far as what impacts are allowed um, based on rare natural plant communities, things like threatened and endangered species. Uh, there's the 5% rule. You can't impact more than 5% of the wetlands that you own on your property. Um, so now we're gonna get a little bit more into how local governments regulate wetland projects. So basically, Wetland Conservation Act, our, our main idea in the legislative to strive for no net loss of wetlands by avoiding and minimizing impacts to them. So we kind of need to know where we're in the state we are when we're making these decisions on projects. So here's that map I was discussing. So we're in the greater than 80% area up here in the Northeast. So um, basically, it's saying that greater than 80% of our wetlands have been retained since statehood. Uh, this area on the, the southwest and the northwest, less than 50% of the wetlands have been retained. Whereas in this little band here in the middle of the state, we're kind of somewhere between 50 and 80%. And the rules actually differ depending on which one of those zones you're in. And then secondly, regulating a project is base, is kind of relies on five major factors. Um, one is the wetland type. You know, so what type of wetland are we dealing with? Is this project going to happen in shoreland? And I will describe what shoreland is in a little bit. Uh, if it is in shoreland, where exactly in shoreland are we? Um, is this project a no loss project? Are we, are we doing something that's not going to result in wetland impacts? Is this wetland impact going to be exempt? Is it going to fall underneath that allowed amount of impact, which is also called the de minimis, is your word for the day? Um, or is it going to require mitigation? Does it exceed that exemption? Uh, additionally, there's a statute 1599, which gives local governments a certain timeline to make decisions on projects when someone comes to me with a wetland project or an application for a wetland project. So as I said before, we need to consider where your project lies on the landscape. So I pulled all this directly from rule. Um, shoreland and non-shoreland properties are, or projects are granted different amounts of de minimis in underneath the Wetland Conservation Act. Again, de minimis is that allowed amount of wetland impact, which the LGU gets to decide for each property. Um, so, Again, shoreland is a good example of it is right here. So if we've got a public water river flowing into a public water lake, anything within 300 feet of that river 
is shoreland. Or if there's a wetland or another water body touching that, again, that also makes it shoreland. Or within a thousand feet of a lake, um, another is another one. Uh, so again, there are allowances for impacts. So up to 400 square feet outside of the structure setback. So again, like with each of these public waters, your local government is going to have an ordinance which establishes how far from that water body can I build a structure. So there's allowances for impacts outside of that line up to 400 square feet. When I get inside of this line, I can only impact up to 20 square feet of wetlands in this area, according to the rules. Um, you know, and who this WACA LGU is may, may vary depending on the jurisdiction. Like if we're dealing with a wetland along a public water lake, that's actually going to be under the jurisdiction of the Minnesota DNR um, if it's state property. Um, if it's private property, it might belong to me. Uh, just kind of giving you some examples of how things work. Um, so exceeding any de minimis exemption will require mitigation. So meaning we might need to get into a replacement plan. We might need to discuss what you need to do to offset this project. You know, kind of, again, this is how my mind is working as I'm looking at projects. Um, again, things like calcareous fens are off limits, rare natural plant communities uh, differ in what's allowed in those areas. Threatened and endangered species might even halt a project, for example. Um, possible exemptions for habitat creation are, you know, are in there as well. So I'm just kind of throwing out some things that are possibilities. Does that mean uh, it's possible exemptions for wetland habitat creation? Yeah, possibly. I mean, it, it's up to the LGU. Um, you know, they, you would have to discuss with them what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And there might be a requirement as far as an application for an exemption as to, you know, how are you going to do this project? What are you going to do? What's the end game? Uh, there might be some requirements for monitoring even. So, you know, there's, there's some things that are allowed in there. And we'll, again, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit more later. Uh, also on the North Shore, we've got the North Shore Management Zone. So this is kind of a different thing as relative to other parts of the state in that we have this kind of described shoreland area along Lake Superior and Highway 61. Differs a little bit in how um, we look at what shoreland is, but anything within the North Shore Management Zone is shoreland to me when I'm dealing with wetlands. So again, as the LGU, I then have to take your project and I have to funnel it through one of these three areas. So is it a no loss? Um, are we going to require an application for this? Do I need to document what you're going to do? I don't need to follow Minnesota statute on making a decision on it in terms of like, I don't need to wait a, a certain amount of time to issue a decision. Um, but, you know, things some like examples might be a, a trail project that's going to go through a a wetland swale for a snowmobile trail or something like that, where we're not going to put any fill in that wetland, uh, but there's going to be some clearing. So we need to do that. I, I, you know, I might need to look over that person's shoulder and make sure they're doing it right. Uh, is, it a, is it an exemption? Is this project able to be done uh, underneath one of these possible exemptions? Uh, you know, agricultural activities, uh, drain tiling, maybe we don't deal with that a lot up here. Um, restored wetlands, incidental wetlands, again, those aren't regulated by the state. Uh, are we creating wildlife habitat? Are we doing this under a de minimis exemption, one of those allowed amounts of impacts for each property? Uh, public utilities are allowed some, some leeway in terms of putting in their infrastructure, uh, as well as forestry projects are, are exempt as well. Um, Elena or Tara, am I doing okay on time or should I wrap it up? Um, maybe 10 more minutes and we can leave the last five minutes for only, questions. Yeah, Does that I've work for got, you? I've only got like seven more slides left. Perfect. So. Um, or is it a replacement plan? Um, you know, there might be some site specific replacements. Those are usually for larger projects, like someone's building a Costco or something like that in Hermantown. Um, 
wetland credit transaction is the usual way that people deal with projects um, when we're dealing with private landowners. Like if you need to put a road through a wetland resource and it's you got a lot of wetland to cross, you're probably going to deal with a replacement plan, especially if you're in a shoreland area. Um, you know, and once, you know, kind of an important detail is like when we're dealing with an exemption and you exceed that exemption amount. So say if I've got 400 square feet to work with and my project's going to impact 500 square feet, well, I actually have to replace all of that 500 square feet. I don't get to start after the 400. So just an example of how the rules work again. Uh, if it comes to a replacement plan, again, like I just said, the entire impact must be replaced. Um, and as we get into replacement plans, there's the application process gets a lot more intensive. You need to avoid and minimize wherever you can. So we're gonna scrutinize it at the local level. It's gonna go as to state and federal agents as well. They're gonna look at it and make sure that you're doing your utmost to avoid these impacts. Um, you have to have this discussion of an alternatives analysis. So if you've got a property where you've got a perfectly buildable site, like say you're, you're on a, sh a lake shore, um, you want that home down right 100 feet from the lake where you can see your, the lake from the house, right? But there's a big wetland out at that setback. But you've got a buildable area, you know, 300 feet away from the lake. Well, you're going to be relegated to building that house 300 feet back because you know you've got to avoid and minimize that resource the impacts to that resource um talking about the lgu decision you're talking about a governmental agency such as the corps of engineers they do have regulatory authority in a lot of yeah. water bodies of the state um as well as this the minnesota dnr has regulatory authority uh other you know, other entities like the Board of Water and Soil Resources, they actually regulate my decisions as well. So um, they're looking over my shoulder, making sure I'm doing my job right. Um, you know, and as I was saying, you know, economic and aesthetic considerations are not supposed to inform my decision. I'm not supposed to take into account, you know, the property values going to be changed if I don't build my house down there or, um, you know, just those aesthetic considerations. Um, and just kind of a small detail, replacement credits must be sought within the bank service area where you reside first. So if you've got a bank open in your area, but you can buy credits somewhere else in the southern part of the state for cheaper, well, you need to buy them in your area first. Um, so again, it's you know, not always so friendly. You're obligated under state rule to notify your LGU before any wetland impacts occur on your property. I'm supposed to be the guy keeping track of whatever's going on in Cook County when it comes to an impact to a wetland. Um, doesn't matter if it's after the fact or before the fact, I'm supposed to know about it. Um, they have the, I have the authority to make determinations on, pro determinations on projects, exemptions, delineation accuracy, all this sort of stuff, replacement plans. Um, you know, I, as an LGU, I don't do delineations for people. I don't identify wetland boundaries, but I review the work done by delineators. So I'm looking at, you're going to, you know, I might require that someone hired a, del a delineator to identify all the wetlands on their property before we start projects. Um, just helps me be a better at my other hat that I wear of planning and zoning and just looking at building a house or where to put a septic system. Um, you know, how to, how to cite things and develop responsibly. Um, you failure to adhere to the Wetland Conservation Act, which is also known as AE 420, Rule AD 420, may result in involvement with the conservation officers, might issue resource protection notices, restoration orders, all those not fun things, the things that I don't like so much about my job by having to wear that hat. But um, it's kind of a necessary thing you know to ensure that wetlands are protected um as well the other part about my job is i like being a resource for people to suggest solutions as to how can we develop responsibly i will try to go through and you know discuss options with people as much as possible before we get that delineator or the wetland professional involved you know if if i can avoid that at all i will try to do that for landowners uh, and i i want to avoid 
heartache. I want to avoid unnecessary costs to folks wherever I can. Um, but ultimately, it, you know, I didn't put wetlands on the landscape. And if they're there, they give me a duty for preserving them where we can. Um, yeah. What are the bet wetland banks? You mentioned that a few minutes ago. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about oh, that. Oh, okay. Sure. okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, so again, all, all Wetland Conservation Act LGUs, that's, that's me, the local government unit, have a TEP to call upon. TEP is short for Technical Evaluation Panel. Uh, usually comprised of people like the Board of Water and Soil Resources Specialist for that region. Um, Minnesota DNR usually has a representative on that panel. It might be the hydrologist, might be a local fisheries guy, uh, just somebody who's weighing in and looking at, you know, resources that might involve state areas like public waters, things like that. Um, uh, usually an SWCD staff member or maybe even a watershed district staff member is going to be on there. Sometimes the Army Corps project manager is going to participate as well. Uh, you know, the, the duty of these folks are to, you know, offer facts and findings and professional opinions to the LGU and help it inform their decision on what, what they're seeing. So it's not just one set of eyes looking at these applications. Uh, yeah, so ask not what your LGU can do for you, ask what you could do for your local government. Um, reach out early. If you've got a project that you've kind of got in the back of your head, find me or find your local government units and, and talk to them. You know, announce prevention when it comes to looking at a project is worth a pound of cure. You know, just don't go willy nilly and, and start doing things before having talked with that person. Um, Another thing that really helps me is come in with a good plan of what you want to do. Uh, you know, if you have any preliminary sketches, if you have ideas of how you'd like to develop your property or some projects that you'd like to do that are maybe a little bit off the cuff, uh, you know, get it on paper and maybe we can look at it. If I can, you know, have that thing on paper, I can usually pull up your property, look at it with really fine detailed top topographic maps and kind of just see if it's going to float. And then, you know, if we've got to make adjustments or I could suggest some solutions that are maybe a little different, um, you know, that's what we can do. Like, you know, when we're dealing with uh, getting to a house site right here, you can see, um, and we've got a couple wetland basins to avoid. Well, maybe it would just be simple to just go around or, you know, if, if we've got to cross a wetland, if there's no way to avoid it, let's cross it at its narrowest point. Uh, and additionally, just be flexible. You know, you have to come into this with an idea that you're maybe it's maybe your project isn't going to be exactly how you envisioned it. Um, but that's what we're here for. You know, we we want to help you through it, but it might not look exactly like you want. Um, well, yeah. seeing, seeing if a project would float, is that an intentional pun? <laughs> Yes, it was. <laughs> My son will tell you how bad I am with puns. Um, and again, another thing that really helps me as a regulator is, is if you see something that's suspicious, um, if you see your neighbor working in a bog, uh, give me a call. You know, if you have some questions as to what's going on, I really rely on, you know, local folks keeping an eye on the community to, to inform me about, you know, enforcement actions that might need to happen. And again, you know, as I was saying, I'm not the only permitting authority, um, you know, so just because things might be okay with me in terms of a project, it doesn't mean you might not be okay with the state, uh, you know, or the Army Corps. Army Corps has a whole different set of rules with the Clean Water Act that they enforce. Uh, the state has the Wetland Conservation Act, which we enforce. So, um, you know, just different rules out there and I don't oversee all of them. Um, yeah, so again, there was other topics that were open for discussion. I'm kind of nearing the end here. Uh, so establishing a wetland bank, if anybody has any questions about that, I can kind of do a quick rundown. Um, really, there's kind of the first thing that the state looks at when we're considering a possible bank site is how much wetland is there. There has to be at least 40 acres of wetland area before they'll even consider it. Um, it has to generate at least eight credits of wetlands, which apparently is about 40 acres. Um, so 
you know, they, they won't even give it a second look if it doesn't meet that threshold. Secondly, they're going to start looking at, well, what type of a resource is it? Is it going to be one that, because there are two types of wetland banks. There's restoration banks. So we're, we're taking a wetland that's been significantly degraded and we're restoring it, either restoring hydrology to an area that's been drained or removing, you know, possibly some sort of development from a high value or from a resource that's been degraded or, or whatever. Uh, secondly, there's preservation sites. So bank, uh, wetland banks in Cook County have all thus far been preservation sites. So we've got really well, uh, a really high value, high, high functioning wetland resources that um, usually adjacent or flowing into a public water um, that make it, you know, something that's worthy of preservation. Additionally, there needs to be some sort of demonstrable threat to that wetland, you know, development, uh, logging, mining, something like that, that might, you know, threaten that resource. So kind of, those are generally what we're looking at when we're looking for possible bank sites. Um, you know, if you have any questions about a potential site, reach out to your LGU, uh, get in touch with them. They can usually get in touch with their um, Bowser representative and kind of discuss, hey, this has been floated to me by uh, a landowner. They have an idea for a bank site. What do you think? You know, then it usually falls on the landowner to then start doing some of the heavy lifting. Usually it involves hiring a wetland professional, delineating the area, going through a concept plan. Um, and it's really a long process. I mean, typically if you get involved in it, you're looking at three to five years before you're even up and running. Um, so it is intensive. Mitch, what, another yeah. question. Do, sure. do, you, do you mean that um, they would look at, somebody would look at the 40 acres of the uh, alleged uh, bank uh, uh, material mm -hmm. to see if one of those, any of those eventualities like logging, whatever, uh, would be a likelihood and then maybe value it accordingly? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, there's a discussion that is had during the concept phase of the project. So, um, you know, I mean, there could be any number of factors that, that could be, you know, a consideration, like maybe there's, we're talking about putting a housing scheme right next to it or something like that. I mean, any number of factors that could potentially threaten the, that resource, you know, whether from a perspective of, you know, impeding flow into that area or mining in that area nearby or um, you know possibly possibly the introduction of invasive species through any of those activities you know that's all kind of a, a broad discussion that's had kind of getting a little deeper into it but you know it, it's something that you know like as a for instance if you owned a inaccessible parcel of you know 200 acres way off in the boonies that no one can even get to, you know, is probably not something that's going to reach, you know, that threshold. It might just kind of flop before we even got off the ground. Sure. Um, yeah, um, if anyone wanted to go a little more in depth on exemptions too, we can discuss that. Um, and then again, I, I, as much as my ego tells me otherwise, I am human. And I do make mistakes. And, you know, there is a process in place for any decisions that your LGU makes, uh, you know, to appeal. Usually it's kind of at a more local level at first, um, you know, but it can go higher than that if needs be. Um, just kind of, you know, just, just informing you of your rights that, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm not perfect. And there is a protocol in place for if you, if you, if you have a dispute with your local government unit, um, it's not always so fun. I've never been appealed before, but uh, it's out there if you need it. Uh, any questions on any exemptions or anything like that before I end? Uh, Mitch, this has been really valuable. I, I'm on, a, uh, on Lake